Welcome back again, Internet. You know the drill by now. We're counting down my top 30 favorite games of all time. We've gone from game number 30 all the way down to number 11. Now it is time to finally crack the much-anticipated top 10. Let's get to it. Number 10, Shovel Knight. I try really hard not to get too overhyped for games because it's been my experience that your expectations will only ever let you down. But I just couldn't help myself. This was a game that I had been looking forward to for an insanely long amount of time. And when it finally launched, my goodness, it was everything that I had dreamed of and more. It completely destroyed all of my expectations. I've noticed in the past few years that there's been a recent um, influx of games that are clearly meant to target your nostalgia. I could be wrong about this, but I feel like Shovel Knight was kind of the first game to really sort of kickstart that movement, if you will. Luckily, it actually had substance behind the style. Not only that, but the style itself was actually justified. It really did a bang-up job of recreating that old 8-bit aesthetic feel to it, and I think did justice to the spirit of that era of gaming. This was a game clearly created by gamers of that era. You know, just basically every memory that you have as a kid growing up with those kinds of games, it just was the perfect blend of all of the good stuff. The people who made this game clearly have not just given this a lot of thought, but it seems obvious to me that it's something they've been thinking about for a long time. They've gone to the trouble of already in their minds worked out exactly what all of the good parts of all those old nostalgic games were and figured out what didn't work and just sort of perfectly separated the two. So in the end, you're just left with this perfect hybrid of all of the good stuff. Everything from the way that the graphics are implemented to the controls themselves, to the mechanics, to the storyline. It's just so expertly crafted and handled with such immense care it feels like this game could have come out in the late 80s to early 90s, and if it did at the time, it would have been considered the best game in its class. The only thing I can potentially think of to criticize it for is its overall length. The main storyline did seem to resolve a little bit quicker, at least than I was expecting. I mean, you start off the game with this clearly Super Mario Bros. 3 inspired type of an overworld map, and it just immediately gets you thinking that what you can expect from there on out is an adventure about the size of Super Mario 3. So to that end, it feels like when you get to the end of the game, you would have expected that to just be the end of the first map. But no, that's it, kaputs, you're done. As far as the storyline itself is concerned, I guess it made sense. I just wanted more of it. But then again, that speaks to how good it was, that it really keeps you wanting more. Having said all that, it has to be noted that Yacht Club Games continues to put out new content for the game year after year. Whole new storylines, new characters with new power-ups and abilities, new ways of getting through the levels. And maybe what I think is the coolest thing about it is that the storylines all seem to mesh together really well. It's not just a totally other separate adventure. They actually do kind of overlap a little bit. Now, if they could just frickin' finish the King Knight levels, that would be awesome! If you're a fan of old-school 8-bit side-scrolling games and you haven't played this game, you are missing out. Number nine, Portal 2. So the first Portal just barely cracked my top 30 list. And for good reason, that game is fantastic in its own right. This game, I have to say, is one of those rare examples where the sequel is not only better than the first game, but improves upon it in literally every single way possible. There's not even one aspect 
of the original Portal that I can think of that I would say, no, actually, the first one does it better than the second one, just a little bit better. Nothing. I'm not going to waste too much time talking about this, because basically everything that I could say about it, I've already said about the first Portal. Just go back to that video, listen to what I said about Portal, and then amplify it by a million. It's that good. Number eight, StarCraft II. Oh, oh, I love this game. Oh, I love this game. Oh, I love this game. Jeez, get a room, you two. You know, I know you're being sarcastic, but that's actually not a bad idea. Come on, Jim, let's get out of here. Now, seriously, the same as what I had said with Portal 2, again, I would recommend you just go back and watch what I already said about the first StarCraft and just amplified by a million to get my feelings on this game. It's everything the original StarCraft should have been, and that's saying something considering the piles of praise I already heaped on the original. I don't know what exactly I can say about it without sounding like I'm just ad nauseum repeating myself, so just take it from me, best RTS I've ever played. I mean, I mean, look, I mean, look, I mean, I mean, look. How do you not, how do you not fall in love with this? Oh, hey Kerrigan, you're looking pretty good over there. No, Jim, I swear it's, it's, she's nothing to me. Number seven, Metroid Prime. You knew we had to get back to the GameCube eventually. Full disclosure, I had never played a single Metroid game before this game. In fact, to this day, I still haven't really played many others in the franchise. So I can't say from personal experience how well it stacks up to the others. But from what I've been hearing, it's pretty damn well near the best. I think Super Metroid is probably the only other one that seems to give it a run for its money. And I keep hearing again and again that it's an absolute must-play game. I'm sorry, guys. I haven't gotten to it yet. I promise I will eventually. Maybe in another 10 years from now, I'll update this list and include it on there. But for now... Now, this is my favorite Metroid game, and it's one of my absolute favorite first-person shooter adventure games. In fact, one could probably argue that first-person adventure game was a subgenre that was created, even necessitated, by this game, because it just blends the genre so well together, people at the time didn't really know how to categorize it. They had to kind of come up with its own subcategory. And luckily, as you might expect from a situation like that, where a game would try to do too many things at once and end up kind of failing at them all, this one excels at them all. This is a game that knows exactly what it is, exactly what it's trying to do, and it accomplishes it in spades. It did it so well, arguably too well, because it's now become the gold standard by which I compare all other games in its genre to, and from my perspective, none of them really seem to quite live up to it. I think it really says something about a game that starts a genre that it itself did it better than every other game to follow after. I also absolutely love how the story is told. I've actually heard it from some other people as a criticism. They don't like how you find out sort of the plot details of the story sort of after the fact. But for me, it really enhanced the believability of that world that much more because it makes sense when you think about it. You are on this foreign planet among the ruins of an ancient civilization and derelict spacecraft where the prior occupants have long since left. So of course, everything you learn about what's transpired is going to be events that happened before you arrived. And I just love that idea. In addition to everything else you do in the game, the combat, the puzzle solving, the exploration, it also makes you feel a little bit like a detective. It's as though some crime was committed somewhere, you were called into the crime scene after the fact, and now you're there conducting your own little investigation to ascertain what took place. 
And of course, even without that whole element present, the game still would have been awesome on its own. The puzzle solving is really clever, the combat is fantastic, the graphics are gorgeous, and it makes you absolutely love inhabiting Samus's suit. You really feel like you're inside that Kozo made power suit and taking advantage of its modular design, constantly upgrading it, getting new power ups all the time. I know that's kind of a tired trope by this point in video games, but it's tried, tested and true. Honestly, I think the best way that I can put it is that it feels as though when they were conceptualizing the game, they had this vision for what they wanted to be with the game, and through the development process, they just somehow managed to incorporate everything that they wanted. It really seems like they didn't ever have to sacrifice anything along the way. It's just perfect. The implementation of how all of the mechanics work together with exploring this world just feels so smooth and cohesive, and I can't even imagine how they could have done a better job. Number 6. God of War Ascension. This title might surprise some people over the fact that it's on a top list at all, but it may not surprise you so much that it's coming from me, as I've already stated, I'm God of War fanboy number one, and there's already been a number of titles on this list. Why not this one? I think it's fair to say this one was easily the most divisive game in the series. Even though this game was following on the tales of Ghost of Sparta, let's face it, being a PSP game, not a lot of people played that one, so people were mainly comparing it, I feel, to its PS3 predecessor, God of War 3. That game was so good that it really had people's expectations for the next console game really sky high. At the end of the day, I think that what people's problem with it wasn't that it wasn't a good game, but that it was just kind of more of the same. Now, from a certain perspective, I can understand that argument, I see what you're saying, but at the same time, you have to admit that when this game came out, this was the most different in the franchise. I was truly surprised with just how many things they changed. In fact, to be honest, at first, I kind of didn't like it. I actually have to admit, I was struggling with adapting to the changes. I really just wasn't seeing what they were trying to go with, or what the rationale was of making the changes that they did. And I guess ultimately I was hoping to just sink my teeth into more of the God of War experience that I had come to know up until that point. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to make it sound as though this game is radically different than the rest of the series. At the end of the day, it's got more in common with the other God of War games than not. But having said that, it was still different enough that it felt intensely unique. So yeah, it was a little bit more difficult than I was expecting to get comfortable with it. But with that being said, when I did, oh, the game becomes incredible. I really feel like a lot of the criticism this game received is very much unjustified. I think it's also one of the more difficult games in the series, and when you consider how difficult they already are, I can also see how that would be a little bit of a turnoff. But, but, give it a fair shake, I think you'll find there's a lot of redeeming qualities about it. Jesus, I say that like it's got a whole list of cons. It, there's really almost nothing bad for me to say about it. I absolutely love it. And while I have always maintained that the puzzle solving throughout the whole God of War franchise is still pretty clever, this game really takes it to a new level. It warps with your mind in ways that I wouldn't have expected. You know, for such a brutal hack and slash game, it's easy to expect it to be just kind of a dumb brawler. That's actually one of the things I love about the series the most, is that it pulls this kind of switcheroo on you and turns out to actually be quite smart. I will say, I didn't care for the storyline quite as much as the other games. But where the game really counts in the gameplay and the mechanics and the level design and the weapons and everything that has become mainstays of God of War as we know it, it seriously shines out among the rest. Number five. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. 
This is the shit. What do you even say about this game? You know, I like Zelda. I don't obsess over it. I'm not the biggest Zelda fan in the world, but I know what I like. And given that I was a big N64 kid, this was my world. One of only three games on the N64 to actually require the expansion pack, this game shows you why. It's one of those games you just have to play. And I hate saying that because it sounds like such an obvious cop-out and something that you could say about literally any other game. But for this game, it's really kind of true. It comes together so tightly and so perfectly packaged that it leaves itself in the realm of beyond description. I half wonder if that's not because of how emotional of experience it is. It's really difficult to translate verbally your own subjective emotional experience. And after all, due to the nature of subjectivity, it's gonna be different for everybody, so that really is seemingly what it comes down to. You just gotta play this yourself and make up your own mind, but I suspect you're not gonna have much bad things to say about it. And if you think I'm kidding about how much I potentially could talk about this game, you'd be mistaken and I'll prove it to you. For those who don't follow my Facebook or Twitter, you may not be aware of the fact that not too long ago I just recently started a blog. I've included a link to it down below in the description for this video and you can check out the first article that I've published, a 7,000 word essay all about the merits of the different masks in the game. That's just one aspect of a massive adventure. I feel like I could probably lecture on this game enough I could teach an entire college course on it. And on that note, while it occurs to me, one other thing I did want to quickly mention, though this doesn't have anything to do with the game itself, it is directly related to it, so I just wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to give a little PSA. As I have done for the last six years now, I will be participating in this year's Extra Life Charity Gaming Marathon. For those of you who don't already know yet, the Extra Life Foundation is an annual charity fundraiser in which participants play games for 24 straight hours to raise funds for local children's hospitals. These hospitals in question are spread out across North America and are all partnered with what is, I believe, known as the Children's Miracle Network. Participants can go online and set up their own account on extralife.org. And from there, you can actually select any hospital that you like from that network and your funds that you raise never actually exchange hands. They are all handled digitally and they go directly to your selected hospital. 100% of all proceeds go straight to helping kids in need. And what really makes these particular network of hospitals stand out is that they all treat their patients regardless of their family's ability to pay. I double dog dare you to think of a better cause than that. I am going to be doing a 100% completion run of Majora's Mask. Some people say that 24 hours might not be enough time to do literally everything there is to do in the game because it is so massive, but I believe that I have what it takes to take on this challenge. So if you are both willing and able to make a donation, please do visit the link that I will also place below in the description. It'll give a complete outline of everything that's going to be transpiring at the event, what I'm going to be playing, including this, and exactly where funds that I raise go. In my case, it's going to be the Hamilton McMaster Children's Hospital. I know money is tight for a lot of people, but if you can consider donating to only one cause of the whole year, I very much urge you to please consider this one. This is something I've been doing for years now. It's a cause that means a lot to me, and I know that your generosity will not go unappreciated by the kids themselves and their families. It's quick, it's easy, it's painless. All you gotta do is go to extra-life.org backslash participant backslash curse you Jordan. That'll take you straight to my page. You can just click on the green donate button at the top and get started. Also, all donations are tax deductible if that's something that matters to you. Okay, PSA over. Getting on with the list. Number four, Shadow of the Colossus. Remember in the last video when I was talking about God of War 2 and I said something to the effect of how I think you could make an argument for that being the best PS2 game ever? 
That's because I forgot about this one. I feel like everything that I could say about this game need not even go spoken. I can indicate its greatness by pointing to the simple fact that it was later remastered in HD on the PS3 and then not too long ago completely rebuilt from the ground up again for the PS4. That's not something that just happens. You only do that if you know you have a rabid fan base that are going to buy the game no matter what. This is one of those few games that people would be willing to part with their money no matter how many iterations of it get re-released. If the game ever gets remade for the PS5, I'm sure people that already own the last three versions are gonna part with more dollars for that version too. I've heard it before described that the game is basically like a Zelda game, except they took out all of the puzzles, all of the dungeons, all of the different enemies, and only left in just the bosses. It's basically just one big boss rush. <sighs> I'm not going to say that's wrong because it is a relatively apt description of what it is on the surface, and yet I've never really felt that way about it. There's something about it that's just way more deeper than that. I'm not sure if this makes sense to phrase it this way, but I want to say there's something distinctly Eastern about how the story is told and how the emotion of the player is clearly being manipulated. It's done with such care that it's never forced down your throat. Even though it is clearly a very linear experience and you don't have multiple choices you can make in the game, it nevertheless puts you in a situation where you feel as though you're being confronted with choice. It gets the player to be very introspective about exactly what it is that's taking place and what it is that you're doing. It doesn't take too long for players to question the morality of what it is that's being asked of you. If given enough thought, it's not too much of a stretch to start having a question if you're not actually the bad guy. And of course, when that realization hits you, it gets difficult to proceed. Now, of course, naturally you always do have a choice, but the choice being of simply not playing the game. You can choose not to participate in these acts of barbary, but if you do that, then there simply is no game. It's presented on the surface as though it's this classic tale of good versus evil, and yet has this twist on it that makes you reconsider everything that you thought was going on. I feel like I kind of don't really want to get into it much more than that because I feel like projecting my subjective experience on other people sullies what the game really is all about. And to that end, it really comes down to you just having to make up your own mind about what it is that you're doing. In the end, very clever, very fun, and the world they create is extraordinarily immersive. And even taking into consideration just how much praise this game does earn, I still feel, in a way, that it's underrated in its own way. It really has to be played to be believed. Number 3. God of War. But Jordan, you already had God of War on your list. No, this is the new one also called God of War. Personally, I don't really know why it would have been that difficult to come up with a subtitle for it. Other God of War games have one. I get that they were trying to emphasize that this is a new storyline and they're sort of not starting over, but beginning with a new chapter in Kratos' life. But come on, guys, I think you can make that same point without being so lacking in creativity. Come up with another title. With that being said, I do believe you have literally just heard the extent of all my criticisms that I have for this game. Because... Oh my god, this game is good. Remember what I said earlier about God of War Ascension being the most radically different game in the franchise? Yeah, that was then. But then this game comes along and just blows it out of the water because this game is a whole other animal. Seriously, if it wasn't for the fact that it obviously stars Kratos, 
I would have thought it belonged in an entirely different franchise all its own. I mean, not that it was a surprise, mind you, we had known for a long time before the game finally released that it was going to be this way. With that in mind, I was very skeptical. I knew that it was being taken on again by Cory Barlog, the director of God of War 2 and some parts of God of War 3, but I still really wasn't sure how I felt about it. I was looking forward to playing the game, but with bated breath. Again, as I said earlier, as was the case with Shovel Knight, I really didn't want to take the risk of getting my hopes up too high. I never thought the game was going to be bad, per se, but... As good as the other ones in the franchise, I, I really could very easily have seen it going either way. But luckily... Well, I mean, not like I need to tell you. Number one, everybody's played this game. They know for themselves how great it is. Number two, I mean, come on, it's number three on the list. How bad could it be? It was such a funny experience because it at once seems to take everything that makes God of War God of War and throws it out the window and then as your adventure progresses slowly but surely you're reaching back out that window and pulling pieces back just totally seamlessly integrating them back into what this new game is trying to be and it feels so right if you're one of the few players out there that actually haven't played this game by now to be honest with you I'm afraid of even continuing talking because the spoilers in this game, especially if you're already a God of War fan, oh, oh, I, I had I had no idea. I had no idea what was in store for me. Some of the reveals that occur, leave it to the people who have already worked on past God of War titles to be showing the kind of passion to churn out something this polished. This is not only my number three game of all time, but it's probably the best game I've played in years. I gotta say too, that even with my suspicions, it would still probably one way or another end up being a pretty decent game. I couldn't help but shake the feeling that it wasn't really going to be made with past God of War fans in mind. It seemed with the new direction that they were really intending on branching out to a new audience, and that had me scared. And in the end, I kind of felt the exact opposite. While anyone who's totally new to the franchise can absolutely pick this game up and have a lot of fun with it, there's so much detail in the game that only a God of War fan could possibly appreciate, and it is very clearly catered directly to that. And so to that end, I kind of would say that I actually wouldn't recommend this game if you haven't already played the other ones in the franchise. Of course, again, God of War fanboy number one talking here, so obviously I'm going to say that. But ultimately, I gotta say, start at the beginning and work your way up to this one. The payoff will be that much sweeter. Number two. God of War 3. Man, this might have been the most difficult decision for me to make regarding this list, and there were some tough ones. I knew that the number two and three spots were going to come down between the new God of War and this one, but I gotta say, I swapped the two back and forth more times than I can count. While the games have a lot of similarities, in a way, they're actually very different kinds of experiences, yet they feel like very appropriate companion pieces because what one game doesn't do, the other does. And playing those two games back to back really makes the experience feel that much more full and well-rounded. In the end though, trying to decide which one that I liked just a little bit more than the other one, I know this is a tired cliche by now, but it really did feel like trying to pick which of your children you loved more. So, why did I go with this one? Coming back to the fact that how they're two totally different kinds of games, they're not trying to do the same kind of thing, so it's in a way not totally fair to compare them so directly. And with that in mind, I need necessarily to appeal to my own emotional response. And through it all, I feel like God of War 3 connected with me just a teensy tiny bit more. Now why that is, I'm not even necessarily sure I could tell you. I think what it ultimately comes down to 
is it just speaks more to my own personality and just to the types of games that I like. It's tempting to say that it does this for one reason or another, but really I feel like there's dozens if not hundreds of reasons, all working together behind the scenes. Now obviously I was already a huge God of War nut by the time this one finally came out, but when it did, man, man, I mean, you want to talk about falling in love. I obsessed over this game something fierce. Looking back on it, I feel like I really couldn't possibly have been any more impressed than I was. It was like every single element, every conceivable aspect that there exists that you could possibly critique a game on, it did better than everything else I've ever played in my life. I know that's just casually skipping over a mountain of detail I could go into, but really, that about sums it all up. There's no other game that I can think of that is better than this game in any single way. As was the case with Majora's Mask, I feel like I could probably talk about this for hours if not days, and yet in the end, it's really just going to boil down to what it always does. It's subjective, and for me, my subjective experience was that I love everything about it. Through all of the critiquing and analysis that I could put into this game, I feel like in the end, it's all just gonna come down to the fact that, from my perspective, this is as perfect of a video game experience as I've ever had. Which leaves the question then, if this is a completely perfect experience, how is it there can be a game ranked above this? What, pray tell, exactly is the game I've considered number one? And just exactly how do you do better than perfect? So, on that note, we have finally reached the end of my countdown. The number one game. This isn't necessarily the best game I've ever played, it's certainly not the most perfect or flawless, but it is my absolute favorite. Would you like to know what it is? Well, I've been thinking about this. You may have noticed that as I gradually got closer and closer to the top of this list, that I've had fewer and fewer things to say about the game. This is of course because the better a game gets, the harder it gets to put it into words. So when it comes to my number one game, how the heck am I supposed to describe that? So I thought, I'm not gonna talk about it at all. I'm gonna show you. And so, my number one favorite game of all time is... the next game I'm gonna be playing on this channel. Stay tuned. N no, Jim, no, don't go. I swear, she's nothing to me. That was, that was a stupid bit.